Okay. Uh, well, guys, um, thank you for being here. Uh, today, I would like to talk about what is IL weaving, uh, especially with folding. Uh, this presentation is more or less related with a common intermediate language and how we can inject our codes to the already compiled codes. Uh, just to know about the audience, uh, I guess some of you know how the CLR, CLR and CIL work, um, uh, but somebody of you do not have any knowledge about the intermediate language, or you just have a vague concept of, a, of an idea of how it is. Probably mostly have <laughs> how it's working, but in the deep. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, that is embarrassing. I'm sorry, guys. Now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. I think most of the people are like, no basic concept of it. Like, what is it and how it works, but not the deep details. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I will I will do some uh, uh, brief uh, explanation about uh, the CIL, and then we will go in, inside of the intermediate language. Okay. Now, first of all, as uh, you notice in my notes, uh, and you should not, but we uh, it's referring to the process of injecting functionalities into an existing program. Um, it's very related to what the aspect-oriented programming is. Uh, instead of talking about aspect-oriented, I would like to say about cross-cutting concerns, um, which means sections of the code that you need to implement, but they are they do not belong to any part of the application, like caching or logging or security, for example. They are transversal across the old application. That's why uh, if you start to implement, for example, logging into the one existing code, you will have some problems because you're mixing uh, different ideas. And uh, we are trying to do that to avoid that with aspect-oriented programming. And the IL weaving is a technique that allows us to inject this functionality without changing the existing codes. Uh, this is the current realm of the topics I would like to discuss. First of all, uh, what it, are the techniques of weaving and uh, how it works here in Fold in particular? Uh, what are uh, code weaving and IL weaving? Also, I would like to discuss a bit uh, about the common intermediate language, how it is generated, and we will do some exercises here. Uh, I would like to start first of all with a simple example to show how the compiler generates the IL code, and then we will modify this to see how we can inject this. To finally explain um, about the Mono CC library, uh, which is a project from the Mono community uh, that allow us to modify the assembly, um, and finally, Foldy. Uh, before moving into the weaving, uh, I don't know if all of you are <clears throat> completely aware of how the process of compilation works here. Basically, we when we're talking about .NET, we are mostly talking about one common language, which is in this case, the IL, the intermediate language. It's similar to the idea of Java that is compiling into bytecode, but in the case of .NET, we can use different languages. The only thing we need is a compiler. So for example, in the case of Visual Basic or C Sharp, we have our Visual Basic compiler and the C Sharp compiler. As long as the compiler generates intermediate language code, uh, we don't care. We, we don't care in, indeed in the source of the code because at the end both are residing the same uh, final intermediate. And this intermediate language is the lower level before uh, the machine readable code or machine code. So we can still see the intermediate language. Is there is a huge specification made from Microsoft? Uh, about the common intermediate language reference, and that allows uh, the rest of the companies or developers to create their own compilers. At the end, a compiler is just a simple program that evaluates the syntax, validates the variables, and validates how the language is constructed according to their rules, and they are transforming that into the intermediate language. Finally, when we have the intermediate language, we have um, this code that is running in in the CLR that is uh, compiling into a machine code that is executed in the, in the computer, depending on the operating system. But at the end, the intermediate language code is the destination of all the compilers in .NET. 
the case of weaving, well, there are three types of weaving. As I mentioned, we don't want to modify the existing code. We want to inject code. And there are three techniques. One is code weaving, which, which means I will take my existing code and I will have another code and I will mix them into an intermediate mixed code. And then I will compile it and, and then I will have this into the IL code. Uh, in .NET, I don't know, I tried to search, there was a company that was uh, creating some code weaving techniques, and but it disappeared. I, I'm not really sure if in .NET we have something like that. There is a code weaving for Java, which is aspect J, and it's, the idea is uh, basically you have some kind of a compiler for aspect J, you have your own templates or languages, and you have different events. So for example, in the code, in a method, you have before entering the method, after entering the, after leaving the method, before executing, after executing. So you have what is called junter points and they are injecting these codes in, in the middle with this compiler. This compiler generates another code that is sent to the Java virtual machine, to the compiler of the Java and it generates the bytecode. But in .NET, we don't have such things. But basically, this is the idea. The second option of weaving is uh, IL weaving and the graphic is is uh, very simple to understand here. You have the original source code. We have the compiler, which generates the IL code, the intermediate language. After that, doing the IL code, we can inject uh, our codes in IL and compile them again. So basically, we are compiling. We have an intermediate language. We can open this intermediate language and do whatever we want here. And after that, we can package everything again and, and compile. Of course, we need to make sure that the code is according to the structure to package it again. And finally, we have something like machine code weaving, which is after the IL code is running on, on runtime and is, and is compiling to the machine code. Um, but that technique is super difficult because it depends on this operating system. It's, uh, and I, I really don't know if in .NET we have something like that. Uh, that being said, uh, IL weaving is what we are working, what we are interested to show now, uh, because as I mentioned here, as long as we have different compilers, different codes, we can inject in the intermediate language code. Let's see how it works. Uh, well, one other thing that I mentioned at the beginning is about the cross-cutting concerns. Why we want to inject uh, code in the IL, uh, in the intermediate language code? because we don't want to mix the codes here at this level. Uh, we want to have the, the original codes as simple as as clean as possible. And if there are some cross-cutting concerns like met metrics for measuring the time or logging or security, we want to have it in a separate part. We don't want to mix this in the existing code. That's why all of these cross-cutting concepts have to be injected in the different parts of the application, but we don't want to mix them. Here's an example of all of the different cross-cutting concerns that we can work with, security caching, exception handling, logging. And here is an example of how a cross-cutting concern is implemented into the code uh, manually. This is a Java code. You can see here, for example, this method or this class has a print line. In this case, this is a, like a logger. Most probably all of you or all of we we have a bunch of methods where we have a bunch of injections about the logging and we are and we are capturing the exception and if the exception ha fails then we are capturing and sending to the log system or to an, to an external system when we can log what happened but the problem with that is that yeah uh, it would be better if we can have our methods that only implement what the method has to do and then after that try to inject this uh, logging or all of the other metrics or concerns that we want to validate. We can do the same. Um, we can do the same with some patterns. For example, I don't know if you're aware about the decorator pattern on, or dynamic proxy. Uh, on runtime, the idea is that you have your interface and you are uh, overriding this interface with the cost cutting concern like logging, for example and this uh, decorator is calling the interface and, and, and wrapping the call. 
that that's also an option and it's it allows you to have the codes more clean but the problem with that is that on runtime is super expensive it's expensive to inject it's expensive to create a class and to, to have dynamic proxy which uses reflection and in the case of IL weaving one of the benefits of this technique is that we the only time consuming operation is on compile time so for example you have this application uh, during the entire process in the compiler and then the IL code and then injecting the code at this moment the compiler will spend some time injecting the different uh, functionalities that you have to add but that will happen only once because after that you will have in the new IL code the new modified IL code you will have the codes already implemented so that means you are packaging and adding something and then packaging again into a DLL or a or a console application or whatever. Instead, if you are using it via runtime, the problem is that every time you have to get this object, you have to inject manually, and some of the classes are more difficult to manage because the interfaces are could be different, and then you have to have an inheritance or have a strategy for that. In the case of IL weaving, it's much simpler and it's super fast. Here are some links that are very useful, and I recommend you to, if you're interested in, in dealing with this CIL that we will work now. Uh, the first is the list of CIL instructions. Uh, we can see here in Wikipedia this table. We will ex uh, do some exercise with this and uh, you will see how it works. Basically, here are the um, commands or operations that the IL code generates when you are compiling something. Uh, the next uh, link is uh, super cool book about IL um, it's uh, basically about programming in intermediate language and uh, here this book explains how to compile how to execute and modify the codes and what are the rules of the intermediate language and finally this is the ECMAC specification of the um, uh, common intermediate language and it has some uh, definition of how the compilers have to work how do they have to generate the uh, CIL code as a reference is very useful. Uh, do you have any questions so far or not? Is everything okay? If you have questions, please write on the chat, but is it, is it clear? Yeah, it's clear, thanks. Yes. All right. Let's start first of all with this example, uh, the hello world example. I would like to introduce you first with the IL code, then we will do some modifications and then we will see how the weaving can work, okay? Uh, let me start, first of all, I want to open here a new editor. And let's uh, start with the definition of our IL intermediate language code. So let's say the first thing I want to say to the assembly is that I will define a method that is public and its name is main. And that's it. And let's call it let's call it um, presentation.il. This method is the first IL code that we can we want to compile and let's see how it works uh, and let's see in the in the in the IL compiler if it's uh, passing or not so let's go to the presentation here I will say IL assembly uh, presentation IL and it's failing why because uh, first of all it's saying here no entry point declared for the executable what happens here is that when you are writing something in IL, the first command is to explain to the code what is the access point. You have a console application that most probably will run the main program. You have a web application that will run the startup program uh, code or, or something else. Everything in .NET has to have an entry point. In this case, we need to then include the entry point. So we have to say, we can declare a second method for for example. that has no, no definition, uh, but we need to declare one of the methods is the entry point for the assembly. 
So that means this is the method that will uh, be executed when you are running or executing this IL, this, uh, this assembly. And now it's, it's passing. You can see it compiled, no problems, operation completed successfully. But if we try to run this presentation um, executable, it will throw an exception. Why? Because all the codes in .NET in IL return, have to return something. So that's the problem because we need to specify that this will return something here and here, no matter if the method is void in C sharp, the executed, uh, the IL method in, in, in the common intermediate language will be, we have to return something. Let's try it again. Another exception. Why is that? Because we haven't defined the assembly of the project. So the last thing that uh, the IL is asking us to us is to define an assembly, my soft serve. And let's try again. That's it. So the method finished and it doesn't do anything. Let's remove the F1. It's okay. This is the minimum common intermediate language that we can generate. This is the minimum structure of an IL code. So that means assembly, the definition of the name of the assembly, we're defining a method, uh, we're saying that this is the entry point, and then we will uh, return some nothing in this case, but we will finish. And let's uh, try with something different. Hello world, right? And if we start to work with the idea of uh, IL, uh, then the Basically, we need to, when we want to execute something like bar message equals to hello world, and then console right line message. In, in the intermediate language, we will see later that basically we have to generate and to, to assign this variable to the stack of the memory. So in this case, we have to uh, assign the value of hello world, and then we want to call the method which is in the in this the assembly uh, system console and we have to define what is the type of a uh, of a uh, the type of the parameter of this method and that's the way we can execute this uh, console hello world let's see okay something happened here I'm missing something. Wait a minute. Yeah, there it is. Hello world. Basically, we did something super simple. Hello world, and that's it. So you can see this is the IL mess uh, code. We're assigning a variable, hello world, and then we're calling the method. Let's try with the Visual Studio to see how a console application is being contracted when you, when we try to compile this. Uh, guys, if you have any questions about this topic so far, please raise your hand or write in the chat and then I will reply, okay? This is super simple, but it's just only to explain how the IL is generated. Uh, and then I write it in the same folder. As I mentioned, we want to do the same hello world here. Um, it's something that maybe you have done several times during your life, especially when you were studying. So we want to say console right line. Okay, and let's compile this and let's see what is the output. Now I am going to the console application in the binary folder. And we can execute a method that is IL disassembly. 
I'm opening, I want to disassemble the console application. IL ASM is the code that generates uh, uh, the code from uh, the intermediate language to this, uh, sorry, to this intermediate uh, code that is compiled and this is the IL disassembly that opens the console in this case and checks the structure. So let's see here, you can see the console application program here, if we double click in this, you can see the class definition. This is how the compiler generated this class, the program class. Uh, I will not explain in details what is everything here, but uh, we are saying to the, uh, to the assembly, um, generate this class that extends or inherits from the system objects. You know, everybody knows here that all of the classes inherit from object. And this is uh, before filling I don't know. Let's go to the constructor. The constructor is basically uh, doing nothing. We don't have a constructor in this method. So the only thing it's doing here is to say, uh, get a reference from the method in .NET when you are running this application and the constructor, you are passing the same object. So we have to, we have to receive this object and we are then calling the constructor of the base object class, the system object. Uh, this NOP means no operation. Uh, this is like a break, it's like a carriage return. Why? Uh, because when we are debugging, uh, we need to put a breakdown in the, uh, for example, here. Uh, this NOP is, uh, is the way we can debug it. If we, if we compile in release mode, this the NOP will not exist. Well, will will not be there. And finally, we're returning something which is nothing in this case because the contractor is not returning anything. Let's see the main boat method. The main method is interesting, and let's compare it with our code. Here, you can see here the difference. The method is void. Here are the arguments. Uh, no line or no operation, just to debug. Here we are setting the string hello world, uh, the same as here, and then we are calling the write line. And then we are saying no operation and we're returning. So let's try uh, something super simple and will, that will help us to disassemble the application. And we will say output equals to console application.il. And then I want to, to edit this file. Uh, this is what the uh, .NET is doing. Um, here we have the main, here we have the string here, hello world, and I will say hello subserve world. And then I will save it. Let's try to see what happens if we try to compile this intermediate code. Mm. Mm. There's something wrong here. Wait a minute. I haven't changed anything here. Uh oh. This is weird. Uh, console application. It's, let me change the name, maybe. It's because of the, this uh, other svhost file. And this is, the, this is the method, and I will IL answer. Out. Now it's okay. And we will change the hello world for hello software world. And we'll try to compile. And then I will execute the output. And you will see that the only thing we did here was to change, we have a code in C sharp, and we did this. <clears throat> we had a code in C sharp. This is a program which is just writing hello world. The compiler generated the IL code. We opened the IL code in a, uh, this is, we disassembled the code, and then we modified the IL code, and then we compiled this again. And that's way we changed the, ex the existing functionality. So we can more or less say, 
okay, we can have a process where we can compile this and then after the IL code is finished, we can open it and we can modify it somehow to finally package it again and, and have a new intermediate code that is different because it's modified. And if I want to say, okay, I want to include, for example, logging into all of the methods, that's possible because once I have the IL code, I can search the code and I can modify it and include some new methods. And it's interesting to notice, to note that we can, for example, see some, how the frameworks is writing some of the existing application, uh, some of the codes into the, into the IL. So for example, let's say this simple code that does nothing. And let's try to compile it and see how it is being decompiled. Maybe it's because I have it open here. Yep. Okay. Let's see what a simple try catch does. I will go to the main method. You can see here. Uh, again, no operation. We have a try, or a try command, no operation at the beginning. We are here setting the hello world and calling the method console write line, the same as before. We have two NOP, and you can see here leave.s and it's going to the direction 15, which means go to this and this method is returning um, or exiting the, mesh, the, the method. And we also have this section here, the catch. Here we're capturing the exception and we are doing, uh, we are doing nothing here, but we are just leaving again, which is, exist, is exactly what we defined here. You see? It's super simple once you can understand how the IL code is uh, being generated after the exception. For example, you can have the exception here and I will want to write what the exception was, just a message. Here is the difference. I don't know what is this command, but basically we are getting the message. We're calling, uh, a, a, looks like we're calling the getter of this uh, class and then we're calling that. We are uh, setting the variable in the stack and then we're going, again, yeah, we're printing it. So you can see it's super simple to decompile this code that is generating to IL to modify it on the fly for to say, and then we can just inject it again. Uh, it would be great if we can, for example, remove all of of these logs and compile application, open it, inject the order of the logging, and then compile it again. Uh, more or less, we explain how the IL code can be written a simple console application with the console app, and then we open the IL ASM, ASM and the, the ASM, and we were weaving the CIL. Is it clear, guys? Good. All right, let's see what is this super cool library. It's impressive how great this library is. So I don't have any words to explain how excited about that I am. You can see that modifying an IL code is, it's, it's not difficult. I mean, you need to know about the syntax of the IL. You can do some modifications. So for example, let me say this one, we can do something like this. Uh, uh, let me see if it works because I'm not sure. Uh, maybe some references are, are incorrect. Out. Yeah, you see? So it's not difficult to inject codes here. Uh, basically, the only thing we need is to open it, to modify it, and then we have to, sorry, we have to just uh, compile it again. But the problem is that, yes, we need to open this in a text editor and we need to know how to. And, and that's why this library is uh, amazing because basically what uh, Mono Cecil is doing is giving you the right tools to open and to modify 
uh, this code using C sharp or I'm sorry, using .NET codes. So if you want to try this, I, I, I have a good example here. I will show first how it works here. Uh, I, have a, I have a gist here with my codes. Yeah. This is the Mono Cecil. Um, now that I explained to you how this uh, IL modification works, let's see how Mono uh, help us to implement this in C Sharp or in .NET. So you can see here what I'm trying to do. What what I did? What did I do before? I opened the console application with IL the disassembly. I edited it with a text editor and then I modified something and then I save it and compiled it again, right? Mono Cecil is super simple and of course it's huge, but it's similar to what reflection is. I don't know if you have worked with reflection, but basically in reflection you have on runtime, all of the access to the metadata, the tables and all of the references and the properties of each type on memory. So you are running your application, you can get the object and you can call the methods, you can do whatever you want, but it's on runtime because you're accessing the metadata. And this metadata is a huge table which has different references to pointers to other metadata, and with that you can execute and uh, you can do whatever you want. You can uh, run methods which are private. Uh, Mono Cecil is the same, but it's uh, it's at a, at a different level. It is, uh, returns to metadata, returns access to some methods. You can do similar things as in reflection, but the difference is that <clears throat> you have another process that is opening this DLL or this assembly and it's modifying it in memory and then you can save it. Um, here, you, I, I will try to explain more or less considering what we already have done. You can see here that the uh, basically, we are via reflection. We are getting the method right line of the console. This is this is pure reflection. And after that, we are opening the assembly. In this case, my console application. Um, we are accessing this assembly object from Mono uh, The idea is similar to reflection. We have access to several properties, and we are checking if the uh, assembly it's not, uh, doesn't have this name, and then what we are trying to do. If you see here, we are opening the methods of each type, and here's the, the thing that modifies the IL. We have a worker class in this case, and we can have access to the IL. You can see here, we are defining a string in this case, then we are adding a reference to the, uh, to the the write line method, which means is similar to this using a system or system dot something. And here you can see this is super similar to what we have done. We are creating a new operation that is an LDSTR. And you can see the LDSTR is part of the IL specification. So what we are trying to do here is to insert into the stack the value of this string. In this case, we are trying to uh, create this, this uh, syntax that we are creating this command and we are setting this value, code added in something. And then after that, we are calling via reference to this right line method that is here accessing the console right line. This section of the code is exactly the same as doing this in IL. LDSTR here, the same, and then we are calling the system console right line. You see, and and this uh, Mono Cecil helps you to uh, use this approach to inject everything. Anything you want is similar to reflection. is huge, and it has its own objects, of course. But basically, at the end, it's just modifying the IL. And what we're trying to do here is to inject at the beginning of the body of the of the method the code and then we are just executing the processor and inserting the second uh, inserting this thing uh, the sentence this one 
the LDS DTR. And after that, we are inserting the call. And at the end, we are just uh, writing to the console, uh, to the console two, we're writing this code and we're saving it in another assembly. Uh, let me show you how it works. Okay, here I have my simple mono Cecil application as I shown. Uh, we are opening this console application. So let me open this to show you what is the console application here. Um, okay, the console application is just a right line or, or it's a simple code. Console right line hello world, and the and the thing that we are trying to do here is to uh, inject into the hello world uh, something else, something else like um, uh, another method call to the console right line. Okay, the assembly is done. It's compiled. Let's open it and let's see what this assembly does. You can see here. What is happening here is that the, this application opened the console application and tried to insert these two calls here. You see? So at the end, we're doing it the same as we did with the text editor. We're doing it with uh, Cecil. Uh, and we're creating the application, the operations, and Cecil, when we are trying to write the assembly, I can record if it's also compiling and trying to check if it's correct. But uh, basically, you have the all of the tools to modify the IL, uh, and you can do whatever you want because it's simple. It's similar to refraction. Uh, well, not, that being said, Cecil is the super tool that uh, allows you to modify everything. Here, uh, I have the same example as I mentioned. We are creating the LSDTR, uh, which is similar to this in, to the IL code, and now it's time to talk about Foley. Foley is a wrapper on top of MonoCecil that executes the process of IL weaving. So you can see that basically we have done here, we have our codes, the compiler, IL code, injecting the IL code in, in another intermediate language, and then we are compiling again. We did it with the text editor. We can include it in our process. If it's too difficult because you need to edit with a text editor, so we are using Mono Cecil that help us to create these objects using a .NET language like C Sharp. And now we need a process that can take this idea and uh, generate this code. When you install Foley in your application, what are you, you what you're doing is to integrate and to add a new process after compiling your code. So you compile your code, you will generate the IL code, and in that post process, a Fody will take this generated code and will open it and will execute according to some rules, all of the modifications that you want to do using the Mono Cecil library. So at the end, um, Fody helps you to organize the structure on how to implement the modifications with a simple template, and Mono Cecil, uh, has a link to all of the Mono Cecil libraries and, and methods. So you can see here, Fody is the process that modifies the IL and, and has a, little, a, a lot of helpers to help you with this. Uh, I, I don't have a Visual Studio 2019, so that's why I cannot uh, test with Fody version five. 
So I had to stay with the latest four version uh, that works till uh, 2017. And basically how it works, you only need to install uh, the package Fodi, and then you need to install what it's called the Weavers. If you go to the web page of um, Fodi, you will see a full list of different plugins for Fodi. For example, uh, here. You can see here in the page of Fodi, you can see uh, the list of uh, different uh, well examples, and you have also the list of weavers here. So you, for example, need a decorator, you need a login, you need to do something, you can just use one of these weavers or you can just install or, or code your own. So how it works, you just need to install the weaver, the plugin, and after that in the in your application, you have to create the for the weavers XML file. And in that file, you have to include the list of weavers that you want to execute. With that, the only thing that will happen is that the application will compile, then it will open a, a Foley and will check the list of weavers that you have here, and it will try to transform your code. So the first modified a compiled IL code will be passed over this method timer in, in, in this case, and will generate a new IL code, and then Foley will take this one and will execute for the next a Weaver that you install here and so on and so forth. And at the end, we'll generate an output, which is your code injected with all of the rest of the codes. Uh, that was the last explanation, but I have something else to show here. Mm, let me show you how it works here with the Fodi example. I created a plugin for Fodi, so we can see how the structure is. Um, When you want to create a plugin for Fodi, uh, you have to follow some structures, uh, which are super simple. Uh, the only thing that matters here is one big class that is the one that is resolving. It has to be inside the .fodi namespace, and it's, the class name is model weaver. That's the basic configuration, but you can have different weavers for your code. Uh, and this method here, it's using uh, Mono Cecil to modify the IL, and also uh, it has some helpers to check uh, types similar to what reflection does. This method that I created here, it's the only thing that it's doing is here. Uh, it's difficult to explain, but basically we are trying to get the method of the, for each method, we are going to create a string with this value, and then we are going to insert this call and I'm going to insert also an, um, a reference to an action. Um, let me show you. Here, my application, I installed the FODI uh, in the packages. You can see here, it's installed. This is my method tracker FODI code, uh, my plugin that I created. And uh, basically, my method tracker, when it's running in the process, it will take it will execute this. It will check all of the methods uh, for each type and where it will check if the method matches these conditions. So I, I don't want to inject anything in a method that doesn't have a body, that is a constructor or a getter or setter, just because I define it that way. And for each method, I will get the IL processor and I will create this LD STR and I will called the imported method, which is a reference to an, a method. <laughs> it's an action in this case. How it works, here are the instructions of my, of my plugin. You can see the only thing you need to do is install the method package, method tracker Fodi app and then execute the update package to make sure that it works. This version is very outdated because uh, I, I, I think it's not working with the latest version. I have to check what happened. Then you have to create the Weaver uh, file and add the tracker. And then uh, how it works. Uh, the only thing that this method is doing is to inject an action to each method. So for example, this is your code. 
and super simple, super simple methods. And when you run the compiler and then you, you run Fodi, what will happen is that the method will execute this. For each method, you will insert these codes. And let's see how it works. I have my class here. I have my Fodi weavers and it's configured here to add the method tracker. And then I will compile my application. Uh, let me clean it first to make sure. So you can believe me that it's working. Okay. And let's open it. I have a super simple application here, DN Spy. I recommend you if you want to analyze the assemblies. And you can see here, it's the compiling and, and creating a more much readable code. For example, I will open this. Yeah. Here's the program. Here's the tracker class uh, that is uh, derived from Fodi. Sorry. Here is the application. Let's see what it has. We have the for the example, um, you can see here. This is the structure. I have a class named my class. If I open it here, you will see this is what Fodi did. So for each method, I open all of the methods that I injected this code. Tracker register, tracker register, tracker register, you see? And, and that's it. And how it is used in, in the application, uh, in the web page I explain, basically I'm just uh, using and defining an action and for each and when defining the action the action is uh, for example in this call is console write line and it's just running uh, for each method that I'm calling it will just tr execute the tracker which is a reference to an action so let's try to run this one uh, if I run the application and put a breakdown point here you will see how it works now it's here and uh, let's see the output. Sorry. Okay. I'm creating the class. I'm calling the public method. Then I'm calling the internal static method. And then I'm finishing. And when I'm finishing, I'm printing everything here. You can see the only thing I did was to track if the method was called. Why we need to do that? Um, in our project, we are we have a huge application that is super complicated and it's everything connected. So I created this plugin just to understand uh, what methods were entered and at that uh, at which moment to consider some differences. It's just part of the refactoring that we were implementing. But you can do whatever you want in Fodi. There are some very good libraries. For example, one of the plugins is to modify all of the methods depending on some conditions and to check uh, you can modify them all and make them virtual. And that helps a lot because if you have uh, an, an injector on top of that, you can uh, use a proxy, dynamic proxy, for example, to inject uh, uh, Windows Azure services to track uh, the metrics but you don't need to modify the existing methods. Your methods do not need to change. You just need to execute them. Another, which is super popular, is the I notify, notify property change. Yeah, this one. When you have to use WU, Windows Presentation Foundation, or Silverlight, you have to create the event property change, and you have to implement the property change all the time to inform the UI. And with this plugin, you don't need that. You just need this class with the properties, getters and setters, and you can run Fodi to automatically inject the on property change of the code. This is already implemented. And so you just execute the Fodi Weaver, define which classes do you want to modify, and internally you will have in your source code, you only have this, but on the IL or the code that is running, you will have this. Uh, as you can see, it's intensive, it depends on, on what you want to do, uh, but you can modify your codes as you want. 
and, and the only cost is on compile time. So it's, it will be only once. And uh, the possibilities are endless because it depends on you. You can inject to aspect oriented, uh, you can do all of the cost creating concerns and you can modify it. The only thing you need to do is to know something about how IL codes work. Um, and then with Fodi, you can inject this process. That's uh, my presentation. Do you have any questions or any concerns about the presentation? No, okay, that's, that's it.